Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Dix, and I am the uh, founder and CEO of the Crowded Media Group. We are the publishers of Crowdfund Insider. And uh, once again, we have uh, brought together a group of experts to discuss a very important and interesting topic in regards to online capital formation. And this has to do with Reggae Plus, as we call it, a relatively new or updated securities exemption. Um, so today we have uh, Doug Elinoff with uh, EGS. He's the uh, one of the uh, uh, fathers of the Jobs Act, as we, we all like to say. He was there before the legislation uh, came into law. Uh, we have Rebecca, who has recently been uh, noted as, as one of the most influential women in, in all of Canada um, due to her, her, her efforts at DealMaker, which is one of the fastest growing um, platforms or companies, private firms in Canada. So that's kind of like a, like a nice one-two recognition here within weeks of each other. So congratulations for that, Rebecca. And then we have Tom um, Butler with Dalmore Securities, who somebody just acknowledged him as the king of reggae plus. So I, I would like to ask everybody to kind of do a, an introduction of themselves. We'll go around the, uh, the window here. Uh, starting with Atan to kind of share, you know, who you are, what you sure. do. So, Atan, thank you, Andrew. Uh, and, uh, and great to be with you all today. Uh, Atan Butler here. I'm the chairman at Dalmore Group. Uh, Dalmore is a FINRA and SEC registered broker dealer uh, investment bank headquartered in New York and founded in 2005. Today, we specialize in helping companies raise capital primarily online at scale through regulations D, A, and CF. Awesome. Thank you, Atan. Rebecca. Hey, great to be here with this great group. I'm Rebecca Cassava, CEO and co-founder of DealMaker, a technology company powering any type of global exempt market transactions, specializing in Reg A, Reg CF, Reg D, and looking to really globalize this field, give issuer support, setting up a standalone offering with anything they might be, need um, from marketing services, but at its core, the tech stack. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Doug? Uh, New York-based law firm, Elinoff, Grossman and Scholl, 130 lawyers. We've been in business for 30 years. We pride ourselves on practicing what I call disruptive securities laws, trying to help entrepreneurs raise money in new and interesting ways. Uh, the Jobs Act being one of those areas where we had a leadership position back in 2012, as Andrew noted. Uh, but we've been doing it for 30 years. We're heavily involved in the SPAC program. Uh, we're involved in pipes and other forms of capital formation. And that's who we are. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All right. So um, we're going to discuss Reg A Plus today. And um, Regulation A actually existed before the Jobs Act of 2012 was signed into law. But it was an, an exemption that virtually nobody used ever. And so uh, Congress uh, assigned a task to the Securities Exchange Commission to, to improve upon it. Uh, and, and they did. And uh, one of the key aspects of Reg A Plus is you can raise capital online from both non-accredited and accredited investors, uh, and you are exempt from blue, sta uh, blue sky laws. And uh, this turned a, a moribund exemption into something that uh, is gaining in traction today. Um, in 2021, the SEC improved upon it further and increased the exemption from 50 million to 75 million. And, and I see this as a, uh, an important step in the ladder of capital formation for raising money online and securities crowdfunding. You have Reg CF where you can raise up to $5 million. You have Reg A plus where you can raise up to $75 million. And of course you have Reg D 506C, which is an unlimited amount. Uh, and combining the three make a, a powerful ecosystem for raising money online. So I, I'd like to jump right into the questions and I'm going to start with um, Itan, you on here on the right here, that some people describe Reg A Plus as a mini IPO type offering. Why is that? Uh, it's because a company is offering 
uh, their securities to the public, right? So it's a uh, it, it's it's not the same as filing an S one and going public in a more traditional sense, uh, where you're getting a ticker and you're traded on an exchange per se. Um, but it is a tool that allows for a private or public company to take whatever share class structure that's of interest to them and offer it to the masses so that pretty much anyone over the age of 18, pretty much internationally, uh, could participate and buy shares in that. So that's a, that is a, it sounds like a IPO, right? It's, it is a public offering. There, there is a, 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 some similar components as far as what's required to launch one. Uh, you need SEC qualification, you need to get audited financials, you have limited ongoing requirements, uh, regulatory requirements, et cetera. Uh, but it's not, it's very different than a full blown, you know, traditional IPO going public. Uh, Rebecca, do you have anything to add to that? I think that covers it. I think there's some exciting pieces of it where you can do testing the waters. As Itan said, you can go global, we, we regularly will add on um, international exemptions so folks can leverage their digital marketing around the globe. Um, but it, it's really exciting, as you mentioned, how the Jobs Act really transformed this exemption and started to drive some significant traffic this way, letting the average American now invest in pre-IPO deals. Doug, do you have any uh, thoughts on the mini IPO qualification? Yeah, and what's interesting, and I think you can tell them framed it, is up until the Jobs Act, a public offering to retail investors could only be done with a registration that went through the SEC. And after the SEC had vetted it, and uh, you then could offer those securities in the United States of America anyway, to investors uh, of all kinds, both accredited and unaccredited. Uh, Reg A Plus had been around for a long time. It's technically an exemption from registration, I and mean, Reg A had been. Reg A plus allows you to do the same thing, but it's a blurring of the lines because you're offering it to the public like in reg crowdfunding. And so all of a sudden, all these different exemptions have great utility and you have to understand the utility of each of them. They're somewhat different, but all of uh, the three that I mentioned, an S1, a 1A for reg A plus or reg crowdfunding is offering securities uh, to the public and unaccredited investors, which is extraordinary. It just has never been done before in the United States of America. Okay, so um, thank you for sharing all that. Um, under Reg A, there are two tiers. And there's the top tier, we can raise up to 75 million, as, as I've already mentioned. And then there's a second tier, I think you can raise up to, to 20 million. Uh, Rebecca, what are the differences between the two tiers? So from our purposes, we've seen maybe once or twice a tier one. The reality is most issuers are going under tier two, and that's because you can offer up to 75 million and you can be qualified in every state. And so um, unless you're really doing a very focused reggae, like maybe a real estate type issuer, you're, you're going local in one state, the vast majority, 99% of our clients want to be able to offer and close investors in every state. So they're going to, too. Okay. It's yeah. On. Are you seeing anybody using tier, tier one? You see tier one used by OTC companies that are doing small raises and are, are focused on isolated areas that they're planning on raising capital from like one or two states. Um, and, uh, and so if you're planning on marketing and promoting the offering, uh, you're not going to want to go through the, the, the tier one process because it's going to be a disaster, you know, getting registered in every specific state. Whereas with, in, in, with tier two, if you work with a broker dealer that's registered in all 50 states, it's a pretty efficient process to be able to sell your securities, market your securities in all 50 states. Uh, and that's pretty critical uh, if you are looking to broadly promote the offering, which makes so much sense for Reg A, because you could raise capital from anyone over 18, so it really suits itself well for promotion and marketing for that purpose. Uh, but uh, even if you're looking to raise under 20 million, even if it's 5 million, there are certainly advantages of using Tier 2 over, uh, over, uh, over Tier 1. Okay. Doug, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to highlight that the observations that both Rebecca and Etan made 
the problem with the first tier, which is the same problem with the moribund old reggae, is that you have to qualify in all the states in which you're offering the securities. And even though the an organization called NASA, which is the, state, the national organization of state securities regulators, tried to create a, a, a coordinated approach where you could file with just one of the states and then get clearance in many of the states, uh, the whole process was, is still very cumbersome, time consuming, and frustrating because you get comments as opposed to the pathway that's created by Reg A Plus, which has this concept of a qualified purchaser where you preempt state law completely. So uh, tier one is never going to effectively compete with tier two. Okay, all right. I think that uh, I've seen a few uh, tier ones and as um, somebody mentioned, typically it's been real estate offerings. Uh, it does make some sense if you want to raise money from one state, but otherwise, what I hear is that tier one, uh, the raising up to $75 million is a better path. Um, the other question I think a lot of people had when, when the exemption first uh, really became actionable is what type of issuer would be using Leg A Plus? And I, I think that initially people thought that, that startups wouldn't pursue this, but yet I've seen at least anecdotal evidence that very early stage firms are using uh, reggae plus right now so i want to go you know around the room here and, and ask each of you what type of company issuer would benefit from pursuing a reggae plus securities offering i'm going to start with you rebecca yeah so what we're seeing is is companies using reg cf for their initial seed rounds and then when they get to a little bit bigger or at scale they're using reggae plus so we're launching probably between six and 15 new reggae's a month. Those are in a variety of different industries, CPG companies, real estate, energy, robotics, always lots of tech. Um, you know, if blockchain is the flavor of the month, then you'll see more of that, less of that right now these days. Um, and we've seen majority, I would say, are pre, right pre-IPO, but there are some successful companies, OTC listed, NASDAQ, um, who have, done very successful Reg A offerings. The key when they're public is really to differentiate the what's being offered from the publicly traded security. Um, and then you can have a lot of success with it. What are you seeing? Uh, we're seeing a, a rise in sophistication from issuers that are utilizing the Reg A exemption in a number of ways. Uh, as vanilla as setting up a REIT and offering yield to investors um, on their iPhone with a swipe and a you know ACH you know integration. Boom! You're you're kind of a shareholder in that in that platform or structure. Uh, we're seeing um, fractional share issuers using Reg A, and 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 they're and part of the reason why they're using Regulation A is because there's an immediate path to potential liquidity. In other words, you could facilitate secondary market trading way more efficiently and quicker than you can with a another exemption like a Reg D or CF where you have to wait one year. So if that's part of your model, if you're looking to create an exchange um, where investors are building portfolios, Reg A uh, it, it gives you that advantage. We're also seeing, like Rebecca was saying, uh, uh, now that CF was bumped up to $5 million in March of 2021, we're seeing um, more issuers who have maybe Reg A ambitions, um, but as quickly as possible and as cost effectively as possible, they want to be in a position to have an offering page where they're raising money from anyone over 18. And that's what regulation CF also allows for you to do up until $5 million. And if you're concerned that $5 million isn't enough, many of them are also running parallel reg Ds, right? So that you could kind of direct accredited investors to the reg D and utilize the reg CF for the non accredited. Once you prove that you could do that effectively, then you have enough confidence and often enough funding to uh, properly prepare for a larger reggae. Doug, what type of firms are you seeing? The, the calls that we've been getting in the last six months are, as Etan is suggesting, they're much more sophisticated. They're not just one dimensional operating companies or a business plan. Uh, they tend to be companies that are looking at doing what we did with FIG, now Republic, uh, which is a tracking stock for uh, gaming, gaming companies. 
Uh, you will also see similar things with collectibles and automobiles and artwork like Masterworks and Rally Road. Uh, but as those programs prove themselves out, Wall Street professionals are going to see there are many other applications uh, for using the platform of a Reg A Plus uh, offering uh, to do similar things. So I think that aspect of Reg A Plus is very interesting and is just going to increase in sophistication and I think non traditional securities offerings. Okay. All right. So, so you mentioned FIG. FIG is, I think we're going to come back to that later because I think that's a very interesting example of a novel uh, issuer raising money under Reg A+. Plus. Um, the other day when, when, um, when we were talking on the, on the phone, um, Doug, we discussed digital assets. Do, do you want to share some insight into that? Because initially, I think that, that issuers under the Clinton administration thought that this would be a good path for the digital asset ecosystem. What's going on with that? I think it's fair to get me upset only 15 minutes into the conversation. <laughs> okay, yes. well then I'll go there. Uh, I said, I, I, for those who've lived long enough and watched and observed the ICO market evolve, and ultimately the SEC put a kibosh on that and came to the conclusion that certain digital securities are in fact, digital assets are securities, Two deals passed uh, SEC review and were registered on Reg A Plus, and everybody was very excited about it. I think one was Blockstack and the other was YouNow, uh, which we represented until recently. Um, and that was the, those were the first two deals that the SEC allowed uh, digital assets to be registered on or pursuant to the exemption. Um, my considered belief has been for several years now as digital assets have taken off, and I'm not saying all digital assets are security, but certainly the SEC is of the broad view that uh, most things, including NFTs, should be at least presumptively considered in that light. And it seemed ideal to me that the regulatory structure that we put in place in 2012 and beyond, starting off uh, as Rebecca mentioned with Reg CF offerings and then taking it up to Reg A plus uh, in order to get it uh, ready for secondary trading was the perfect pathway for digital assets. And the SEC has not allowed Reg A plus to register or include on that form many forms of digital assets because it, in their view it is neither an equity or a debt instrument. And so they have frustrated the ability to use that form for that purpose, which in my mind is a tremendous mistake while you're sending a message to the marketplace that you want everybody to come into compliance and you have not opened up that channel for everybody. And it's very frustrating. Okay, so to, to kind of like uh, put it all together, digital assets, maybe in the future, not right now, other than that, we're seeing, we are seeing startups, we're seeing more sophisticated firms, we're seeing collectibles, fractionals, and, and real estate. Um, so is it fair to say that Reggae Plus is emerging as a powerful vehicle for interesting and, and unique companies to raise money online? I mean, is, yes. is, is this what we're seeing? Absolutely. The other category I would add to that is Venture Lab Studios, um, investment funds. A lot of folks are really seeing, as Doug was saying, reggae a little bit more proved out now. And so adding it as part of their financing stack, essentially, right? Whether they're going to finance a company and then have reggae and the crowd come in as part of it, they're really seeing the benefits. We have a lot of issuers with real life examples where they got enormous contracts from someone in their community or um, different benefits from the community that they're building around them. And that's why we're now focused on building out shareholder communication functionality so that once you've built that community through the Reg A, you can continue to work with them and really have them help you support in building the company. It's a really cool democratization aspect to ownership, but it's also allowing the power of the crowd to propel the company to new and exciting levels. Okay, that's I think that's that's an interesting and important point. Um, so my next question, as an observer, uh, I think you know 
we call the entire ecosystem equity crowdfunding, but really it's not equity crowdfunding, it's securities crowdfunding, it's investment crowdfunding, because there's different vehicles that we can utilize and leverage to, you know, to re raise growth ca capital. What types of securities are we mainly seeing being issued under reg, reg A plus? Is, is this equity, common equity? Are, are we looking at preferred debt? Uh, what is the, the, the evolving ecosystem? Uh, so it, it, it varies a bit depending on the strategy of the issuer. Uh, generally, you want to keep things relatively simple when you're dealing with relying on tens of thousands of people to understand it quickly from seeing a Facebook ad and then making a couple of swipes on their iPhone. Uh, so you want to keep the structure very straightforward and simple. Therefore, we're seeing a lot of, you know, non-voting common, you know, non-voting common is certainly a, is, is, a, is a popular choice, um, as is, you know, debt, right? You know, again, using like a REIT or a yield issuer for, as an example, um, you could, you could structure the offering and, and fractionalize that component as well. Um, you know, but it's, uh, you know, generally it's, you know, from a, from a startup company perspective that are using like CF or, or an A, you do see some safes, um, you do see some preferred, but I would say the majority of what we're seeing is, is common. Okay. But, but you are seeing some safes. Uh, when we talked recently, we talked about reg CF. I think the, the main security being issued under that exception are safes. Right. Yeah. But yet, under Reg A plus, we're mostly seeing common equity. Is that what you're seeing? Oh, sorry. Rebecca? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I would, go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying that it, it, you know there there are certain marketplace platforms in the industry that have their own you know um, go to structure for how they advise their CF issuers, and, and some of them are quite active, and, and that's reflected in you know that this this kind of analysis as far as what's being utilized. Um, however, you know, an issuer really does have control over that component of what they want to take to market. Um, and so, you know, the ones that are working with us, at least are most of them are choosing common. Sorry, Rebecca. Yeah, I, I agree yeah. with you. The only other thing I would add that we've seen really successfully is the unit offerings with the common and the warrant. And then yeah. we developed the warrant exercise portals about a year now, and that's been really exciting to see issuers bring the warrant exercise portals online and gain additional capital through folks actually being able to go and exercise those warrants. Um, and, and you know, it, it makes what I used to see as kind of an overhang security on the cap table, really a viable, interesting piece of the financing. So I, I, this is new for me. I haven't heard about the, the, the unit warrant structure. Can you give me a little bit more detail on this so I can better understand? Yeah, we, we've seen it um, a lot with public companies, right? So you're trying to, you know, differentiate. You've got like a Dragonfly or Works for it. You've already got a public listing. That's a common share trading. So now, okay, how am I going to incentivize people to buy from the Reg A instead of buying on the public market? I'm going to offer them a share plus a warrant. And then typically in my historical legal practice, like you never saw the warrants get exercised and they just kind of expired two years later. Well, now that issuer sets up on their Invest Now page a warrant exercise and the investors can go and get additional shares when the warrants are in the money and the company can raise an extra five to 10 million. Interesting. Doug, that sounds a little almost like SPAC well, like. It, it is, but it, uh, Rebecca's piece. correct. It comes out of microcap land. Uh, not for to be historical, but there was a firm called D.H. Blair that invented it. Mm -hmm. And it was a way to finance small companies. You raise the money with the sale of the unit with the one share, as Rebecca says. And the way the warrant works, it's usually exercisable at a price of 15 percent above what the original IPO price is. So if the stock goes up meaningfully, then the current holder is incented to exercise that warrant. There's usually a provision, I don't know if in the ones that Rebecca is working on, where the company has the right to redeem that warrant if stock trades up to 80% above the original price tip and maybe 75% above for a penny, which forces exercise of that warrant. But it's a financing technique. It's very clever. Microcap companies have done it for years. But then, as you point out, uh, Andrew, in the SPAC program, it's the rigor in every SPAC, uh, you have uh, a unit offering as well. Interesting. Um, 
Do you, Doug, are you seeing any other types of securities? I know you've been involved with some revenue share things. Um, Those are outliers, right? Um, I mean, I think Eton and Rebecca, who are on the front lines of seeing much more volume than I see, uh, are, I think they're right. You got to keep it simple. And, uh, amusingly, I think Eton said, uh, non, I just want to highlight it, non-voting common. If you said that to the SEC in 2012, that you were doing a crowdfunded deal, but you didn't want to hear from the crowd, and they didn't get a vote. This whole thing would have flattened like a pancake. Uh, but I think they came to the realization that what people want is the economic interest, not the vote necessarily. And so I think it's enlightened that the market's broken that way. But in the tracking stock deals, just for mechanical reasons, we use preferred stock. But, uh, are there other things you can do? Yes. But uh, I think the more you complicate it, the tougher the SEC review you will get. And realistically, I think the econ and both Rebecca will tell you that the harder deals to sell because nobody understands what it is. It's once you get off of common or 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 debt. Okay. All right, interesting. So I think that in the entire crowdfunding sector, the securities crowdfunding sector, there's been a criticism about uh, well, these issuers they just can't raise venture funding. Or, you know, big money's not interested. So you, you go to the crowd. Um, at the same time, I think as, as uh, a couple of you reflected upon earlier, there are benefits to going after a, a broader audience and having a, a bigger cap table of people supporting your firm. So, um, Itan, uh, you know, you're one of the kings of uh, Reg A+. Plus. What are the pros and cons of pursuing this type of offering versus if you are a startup and you have uh, adequate terms from a VC or an institution, take it. Why bother with it, with the whole process and the expense and the time for, for some? Um, it's not that simple, especially in this environment, especially for females and minority owned companies and the other 99 percent that don't kind of get get even get to that point of having to start looking at covenants and dilution and all these other things that come along with VC. Uh, it works for some, but for the majority, it's probably not going to either be an option or work if it was. So how do they raise capital? Friends and family, not everyone has that. It's limited, there's strings attached. Um, you know, going after accredited investors under 10% of the population that everyone else is trying to get in front of and trying to see a good return on advertising spend, very challenging. Um, and you market to the masses and anyone over 18 can participate. You unlock your ecosystem of customers, of followers, friends, subscribers. Uh, and for a company, even a company that's mature pre IPO, um, the terms, they may have enough confidence based on their customer base to fill out a 30 or $70 million offering. They may have enough uh, confidence in their PR machine to generate enough interest to go to do that last raise be pre IPO on their terms and to reward their investors and customers. So everything from a startup where there's clear advantages over the VC route all the way to the end, there, there's pros and cons. And, and those are some of the pros, I think, that, that uh, companies are starting to consider. Okay, Rebecca, I know you have an opinion on this as well. Um, yeah, I, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. I'm also looking, there's a lot of amazing questions in the chat that I'd love to get to. Um, so there was one about valuation I think that ties back. I agree with everything Eton said. The other thing is you're coming to valuation a little bit more independently, right? So you can go out to independent valuators, you can look at comps and really come up with your own valuation, which is far different than having someone sit across the table from you and tell you what your company's valuation is. So lots of different benefits like that, non-voting shares, um, you know, we're, we're big supporters of issuers, founders, that's been my background my entire career, trying to help entrepreneurs get funded. And so I see with reggae a lot of benefits for the entrepreneur themselves. Doug, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'm going to say this somewhat what uh, Eton said, but a little bit differently. It's a false narrative. Uh, just like SPACs are not really competitive with IPOs, what SPACs do is supplement the I private companies looking to go public because there are not enough underwriters and there are a whole bunch of macro market dynamics why IPOs don't work for many companies. They're only for the best deals. 
It doesn't mean that the deals that go public through SPACs aren't good companies. The companies that don't raise money from the venture firms in the first instance are not adverse selection as in they're all bad deals. They may just not be 10 baggers, which is what the VCs are looking for. They may be 7x or 5x, which somebody like myself, I'm perfectly willing to take that risk-adjusted return, whereas a VC wants to either have it be successful or fail uh, spectacularly. And so that's number one. But there are thousands of companies that don't have access to Silicon Valley or New York or Boston. Uh, I think both Rebecca and Eton touched on. What's great about crowdfunding, whether it's Red A Plus or Red CF, is that it is statistically proven that women and minorities are raising more money in this ecosystem. And that's a positive for society, as, and it's a good reflection on the democracy of this uh, capital formation technique. So I, I, they, they are different for different reasons, and one isn't better or worse. Uh, I think Eton is right. If you can get that money, you want to put up with the nonsense that goes with taking in institutional money, more power to you. Yeah, and, and I think that the, the data has shown that most venture capital remains anchored in you know specific hubs, Bay Area, New York City, some Boston. And this is this is an avenue to challenge that and to I know we, we overuse the term democratization, but raising capital online means you don't have to be based in San Jose or San Francisco. You can be based in Ohio. Um, or these other, you know, flyover locations. And I think that's pretty powerful. Um, so I want to keep things going here because I see we have lots of questions uh, showing up in the chat. Um, let's get down to the nuts and bolts. What is the process for launching a, a Reg A Plus funding round? We have to do an offering, offering circular. Um, do we need to use a platform? Do we, can we do it alone? Let's let's start with some of the, the the basic things that we have to do to utilize the exemption in a compliant manner. And I'm going to start with you, Rebecca. Yeah. So there's there's a basic formula that's working really well these days, right? You're going to want a technology stack to help you with your KYC background checks, seeing your investor pipeline, closing that funnel. You need a going to need a good lawyer like Doug, who's done this before, who can get your offering docs prepared and filed quickly and streamlined and through the SEC. You're gonna need your audit, um, and then you're gonna need a broker dealer as well. So you're gonna to wanna to start to marshal all those resources around the same time. Back of the envelope, I know there was a question on costs. I would say, you know, allocate 150,000 to all the setup fees, legals, all those kinds of things that you're gonna to need to get you off the ground. And then you're gonna want a marketing budget as well. And I, I know there's been a lot of questions come through about digital marketing, and we can dive more into that. But rough costs, you're going to want to set aside some marketing budget that you'd be using anyway, right, to get your product or your company digitally marketed. And then you're going to want to have some budget for that until you raise and you can start to use the proceeds of the raise for more digital marketing. Uh, yeah, to start off, you need securities counsel, broker dealer and auditor. Right. Um, and uh, and then kind of depending on your model, um, the, the, the conversation moves more towards technology. If you need a invest now button put on your website or if you're looking to build your own app so that you could release an ongoing number of of, of assets. Uh, and then once that path along that path is also transfer agent and payment rails, uh, escrow um, custody and oftentimes ATS. It's, this all sounds very complicated because there's a number of these different vendors in the place. Um, you know, we've been fortunate to have onboarded over 250 reggae clients. Uh, and um, so we get, you know, we, we serve as a pretty good sounding board as far as, you know, which payment rails to consider. But it really depends on the strategy. A yield issuer is going to be looking at this from one perspective, a collectibles platform, another, a publicly traded company that's doing a raise uh, via reggae, a different path. But ultimately, I think that's uh, from a cost perspective, I think Rebecca's right. You know, we say generally around $100,000 because legal on average is around 60. Then there's a broker dealer cost oftentimes involved. And then there's the cost of audited financials. 
right? So if it's a new code, that's the issuing entity, the audit's going to be low, under 5,000 typically. Uh, or if it's, a more, if, it's, if it's a more extensive company, you need up to two years of audits. That could, that could, that could increase the price from there. Interesting. Okay. Um, that, that's helpful. Do, do you have to work with a platform? I know that there are platforms that focus on the full stack. They do Reg CF, Reg D, uh, Reg A plus. Can you go it alone? I mean, or is this just a gray area? Uh, Reg CF, you, you have to either list on a Reg CF funding portal or through a broker dealer that's approved to be able to, to engage in that type of business. Um, Reg A, you, you don't need a broker dealer, you could issue direct. Uh, you know, most, uh, we're seeing most issuers choose to work with a broker dealer because it makes the, uh, the, the process of being able to offer their securities in all 50 states um, a lot more efficient and, and generally is cost, provided that the broker dealer is providing a cost effective and value add solution. Um, and, um, and so, and then Reg D, you, you certainly don't need a broker dealer unless they could help you raise capital or if you want kind of an added ring of compliance associated with your offering or if you want to hire registered reps or get your sales force registered with the broker dealer so that you could pay the commissions. So it varies. Uh, so CFES, A, most do, but you don't need. Uh, and, and D, it, it kind of, you know, it's available for specific needs. Okay, Doug, I know you you uh, enable or facilitate a lot of Reggae Plus uh, um, offerings. Um, you have to provide uh, an offering circular to the SEC, and it must be qualified. Um, what does that mean? What does that entail? How long does that take? I mean, the first thing you have to realize, Andrew, is that we're offering securities to retail investors in sums of money that the SEC never really wanted to sign on for. It was forced down their throat by Congress. And that means you are selling securities to the most vulnerable investment class and this is a process. It is not for the faint of heart. It is not an, a prospectus like an IPO as in requiring 150 pages, but it, and uh, having an investment banker do due diligence for you and all the th and, and all the things that we do in a traditional IPO. But that's the starting point and it's call that that's why it's called a mini IPO because it represents most of what you would otherwise see in an IPO, but scaled down to accommodate for the fact it's a smaller deal, usually more imm immature issuers, but $75 million or even if it's 50 or 25 is a meaningful sum of money. So this is a full offering document describing management, describing the risk, describing the business opportunity. Uh, and it captures most of the highlights you would otherwise see in an S1, even though it may not be fleshed out to the same level of detail. So it is a real offering document. Uh, it takes, and maybe Rebecca and Ethan have a different point of view, but in, in our experience, 30 to 45 days to assemble it. If you are a business plan, yeah, obviously it's easier to write uh, a, a 1A for a company that hasn't existed before because there's not a whole lot to describe. That's why, and I'm going to frame the numbers that both Eton and Rebecca said, not because it advantages in the E, because it doesn't. Uh, if, you, if you're paying fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars for a one A for the legal alone, that's a relatively new business that doesn't require a tremendous amount of description of the historic business. But if it was, if the business, if the one A business breaks the direction, I think it will with more mature businesses. Uh, with real history of operations and contractual relationships and more dimensionality, I think you'll see those numbers go up and we wouldn't do anything even close for that amount of money uh, just because we tend to use, uh, work with more mature companies. Uh, but it's a very involved process, in, as Etan said, including lawyers, auditors, so that's going to cost money and that uh, takes time to review. Uh, the cap tables usually to reassemble the amount of uh, history of a small company and who's been given warrants and what else is out there takes time. The due diligence itself takes time. So the, uh, once you've put that all together in the four to six week period, you've got it on file with the SEC. Uh, they're going to take 30 days, give you some comments, and you'll probably be done. And I'll be curious to what the other professionals think 
60 to 75 days would be my guess from the time yeah. you filed. And that's only because the SEC is accommodating the Reg A plus world with a more gentle touch than they ordinarily would for more mature companies where it'll take 90 days. Okay. All right. That, I think that kind of makes sense. Um, we touched a little bit on, on marketing promotion. I don't know if we really need to, to dive in that further. Uh, Tom and Rebecca, I know you all, you both enable that as well. You provide services there. Uh, we talked about um, how long it takes to, to put all the, the documentation, the legal forms together. How long does the offering actually take? I've seen a single issue where raise $75 million in a, in a minute. But in my experience, it typically takes months. It just but depends. And one thing, because I time. think both Eton and Rebecca can speak to this, is it's just so important uh, about testing the waters before you undertake all this expense, which wasn't always the case with Reg A Plus, right, guys? I mean, how often do your, and maybe it's that you're, you're worried about too much time elapsing, but do your issuers actually test the waters and determine whether or not there's appetite for the deal? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, ours do. And, and oftentimes, uh, someone who's planning on doing a Reg A might use Reg CF kind of as a, a, a live test of waters type thing. Um, the, the issue, though, with, with testing, there's different ways to do it, and that they, they've evolved as well that are you know, compliant. Um, but you, know, you, you want to be careful about spending too much money getting people to a point where they can't really make a final decision. Uh, but it should give you a general idea of, of what type of marketing and promotional tactics are working well based on how many people are coming to the website and, and, and not everyone's going to leave their name and, and, and email and say, call me when you, when you actually have something to sell me. Um, but if you go into it with the right expectations, I think it could be a great tool uh, to use. Yeah, I actually, I mean, TTW was kind of an interesting uh, uh, quality of the, the exemption, at least initially anecdotally i would talk to people and they say well you know we have all these people sign up they'd say we want to commit x thousands of dollars here's my email but a very low percentage of them necessarily stuck around so maybe it was a lot of work for for little returns i don't know rebecca what you've seen so we're actually you know, our dealmaker reach marketing services are using it more and more these days because what they've found is a benefit is typically the marketing spend you know they're they're testing out, they're spending very little at the beginning of the campaign, determining where the pools of the internet are getting you the best ROAS based on your messaging. And then you're amping up and 90% of the return on ad spend is gonna to be towards the end of the campaign. They're having a lot of success right now with testing the waters um, and then launching and getting an initial boost right at the beginning of the campaign. So that's been a, a new structure that's working really, really well that's evolved over time. Okay. Um, jumping back to how long does this take? I'm seeing typically three months to a year. Am I wrong? I mean, it, as quickly as possible for some, but you know, it, it, it's such a depends, right? You could give examples of ones that sold out right away, both a, uh, you know, and, and CF in weeks and less than a month, uh, that sh shouldn't be anyone's expectations. Um, but again, then the flip side, there's issuers that everyone hears about the successes. No one's out there talking too much about what's not working. Right. There's plenty of offerings right. that uh, are solely reliant on digital marketing and, and struggle, uh, either don't have the right budget or the right marketing approach to hit an adequate return on advertising spend. And their offerings don't succeed. They may hit their minimum or they may not have a minimum. So but but from a their expectations perspective, it's not always so simple. So they may be still kind of cranking through it 10, 11, 12 months and maybe renew it and, and kind of keep going because it was good enough or they, they want to try something new. And then there's also perpetual usages of the exemption that you'll find with fractional share platforms. It's not about it being over how long it takes. It's about how, how do I build a community bigger and bigger that could start looking at these assets and, and perhaps, you know, acquiring some trading on the primary, secondary. Uh, so that's a totally different approach. Like a REIT is these are more perpetual approaches to the exemption. Yeah. And one point I want to make that I think don't, doesn't get talked about enough issuers can spend a ton of time trying to land VC financing and get a big fat zero, or you can work with a broker dealer, try to get an offering off the ground and get zero. So a lot of times people can be really hard on our space, I think, because people, you know, set out to raise 10 and then they raise five. 
well, you know, in the grand scheme of financing, that's a good result and you can build a company off that. Okay. So let's keep things moving here. Once you've raised the money, you have these investors, um, this, I'm going to toss this out to, to Todd and Rebecca. Shareholder management post raise is key and vital. You guys both facilitate that, don't you? We, we, yeah. uh, so, go ahead, Rebecca. Go ahead. Um, you know, we we have a number of different uh, kind of post raise solutions and integrations we work with. We find it depends on again on the strategy. If you're a fund, you have an administrator, you have a more active role. It's more centralized internally. Um, if you're a fractional share platform, you are handling that communication directly through your own technology and integrations. Uh, whereas if you're kind of a one and done capital raise uh, and, you know, and, and you're, you're not really focused on what's next other than kind of your business, then you're going to have to have certain things in place that are that are taken care of. Uh, and they're going to be they're, they're, they're going to be the cohort that's going to have a, a greater need for kind of some of the technology. I know Dealmaker, you guys are focusing on that as well. Um, but yeah, a, a number of different solutions beyond just the transfer agent role. Yeah, exactly. I, mm -hmm. I echo that. It's a, it's a core piece as this space is building and maturing the shareholder communications. Now we've issued them shares. Now we need to give them their quarterly updates. Maybe you can do that by video instead of just text message. And then I know there was a question about the cost of the offering. We have, you know, Venture Lab Studios or folks who are building their own community, bringing down or issuers themselves who are using reggae multiple times, continuing to manage that community. They come in in the next round, you bring down the, co the overall cost of capital for the next raise and the next raise through the ongoing communication. So that's really becoming a core piece of the strategy in these community rounds. Yeah, I, I think that is is vital. It's key. It's not talked about enough. It's post funding, how you manage your investors, your advocates, because typically, like other early stage firms, you're going to go back to the market and raise more money. And I think working with a platform or provider that can assist with that does make it easier. So I'm going to move on to, to the next question because we have lots of questions I want to try and get to. Uh, trading on a marketplace or an exchange, again, under Reg A Plus, it's a unique exemption because once you issue your shares, you can decide to trade your shares on an exchange, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange. And some companies have done this. You don't have to do it. You can also list them on uh, an ATS, like OTC Markets. Um, uh, Doug, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that, trading on a secondary marketplace post offering? Well, I think that's part, that's the next step in the Jobs Act fulfillment of its dream is to create a pathway where illiquid securities can trade uh, can trade on a secondary platform. As you point out, some Reg A plus deals do that on exchanges. Uh, digital assets currently cannot do that. And so uh, I have formed a business called Guard with a guy named Sherwood Neese, who was really the uh, original guy who came up with the idea for Title III Reg CF crowdfunding. And we have a system that provides updated and ongoing disclosure about the issuer in order to satisfy many, by 80% of the state's requirements so that those companies' securities can trade secondarily on an ATS or a platform. And uh, we do that with many of the collectible companies currently. Uh, but I think directionally that will happen with many more of the digital assets that are out there because uh, when you launch a new blockchain your investors want secondary liquidity immediately and i believe that's the only way once it all comes into a regulated environment it's going to be permissible rebecca your thoughts on secondary transactions with the regular plus security? most of our issuers are, are going public on the traditional exchanges still there's just you know better liquidity there, I think, at this point in time. Uh, I think we'll see more go ATS as time goes on, but I, I think anecdotally from what I've seen, ETAM probably has a better view, is is there still liquidity challenges on the smaller ATSs? Yeah. yeah. Um, I know you do a lot of fractionals. Maybe you can talk about yeah, that. Yeah, I was saying that, you know, um, the, the, these are smaller raises and they're, and they're, and they're, and they're fragmented. 
Uh, and there's not like a huge marketplace or an exchange where people are kind of like establishing market makers and looking for opportunities yet. It's still very early on in those days. I think we're going to see it's going to evolve quite a bit, especially as the asset sizes in increase. Where we're seeing most, we're, we, we are very active um, both on the primary issue inside as a broker dealer and also for as a broker dealer for secondary market trading, um, in, in particular amongst many of the reg a fractional share platforms in the collectible space athlete contracts you know yield racehorses you know you name it all that all that that me all, all those clients that make me cool with my teenage kids um and uh and and so we we've we've actually facilitated over i think it's over one hundred and fifty thousand reg a secondary trades within the last year or so and that's so it's it's you know we're at, with over a million reg a primary trades so you, you're seeing an increase in that they tend to be small size uh, uh, trades. These are like someone's buying a ten dollars share in a Michael Jordan rookie. It, it really is helpful to see the bid and ask right next to it, right? It's kind of a hobby, and and, and there and, and that really rounds out the offering, a path to potential liquidity. Uh, there's downsides to it too. What if I spend ten dollars on that card and then there's not a lot going on in the secondary and it's trading at eight? How many times is my wife going to let me keep buying shares if 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 that's what it's worth on that platform that I bought it on? So there's there's some nuance to it. Ultimately, where where I think this is going is to, to bridge the gap between institutional investors and private securities. Uh, and that, with that, in order to achieve that, you need significant enough asset size for this to, to be considered a, a, a worthwhile alternative for institutions to diligence and onboard onto their platform. So I think eventually, probably in the real estate space and in the art space to start, we're gonna, we're gonna see product forming um, with through reggae, with a path to immediate potential liquidity, meaning that someone in a Charles Schwab account, perhaps one day through DTC eligibility, might be able to access pr some of these private securities on ATSs, on exchanges. And that's where things are going to get super interesting. Uh, so I think we're still early days, to, you know, uh, but and, and most of the activity is very early on for like, you know, for the fractional share platforms or later on with a recognizable brand that really is pre IPO. And there's some BDs that focus on accessing those types of shares. So it's, but in, in between where we are with like CF and A, even at the higher limit, people aren't really necessarily interested in paying additional fees for a, a secondary listing on an ATS yet. They don't see the value. They don't think there's going to be enough uh, of uh, interest at this point to kind of, you know, put in what it takes to, to, to make those shares easily tradable to their investors. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Eitan. Early days, I think it's coming. I think the technology is catching up and it's going to happen. We're going to see greater liquidity, um, but that's for a, uh, a different discussion on another day. Um, very quickly, I, I have added this because I think uh, this last question, because I think it helps to um, you know, share uh, um, some, some of your unique experiences in the Reggae Plus funding world. Can each of you uh, very quickly Give me an example of a successful issuer. I'm going to start with you, Tom. Without mentioning names, you know, we, there, there's a pretty high-profile client of ours that's in the modular home space. They've been fortunate to raise over 75 million from retail investors so far, uh, of which most of which occurred on their own website. Uh, we were also able to help facilitate a co-listing or syndication for Reggae, which is something we're super focused on lately. Have, have your cake and eat it too. Direct all your marketing and promotion and your ecosystem to your own site, but also put yourself in a position to syndicate and co-list on other marketplace platforms that have a high number of, you know, hundreds of thousands or million plus, but it's not, you're not sending yours to theirs. You're saying if you want your larger fees, you have to deliver. So this client raised uh, 22 and it did, of that 75, 22 and a half, I think on one very known marketplace platform and a million and a half or so on another. So that's an example of a, a very successful co-listing reggae. Uh, and I think we're, you know, we're working on a number of, of additional ones like that. that that's certainly would be my uh, most recent, you know, interesting one. Awesome. Rebecca. There's a lot. Um, we've talked a little bit about Pubco, so maybe I'll, I'll do a public company one. Dragonfly raised 16 million under reggae. Um, drone company in use, uh, in really improving people's lives in the world today um, in, in uh, the Ukraine. Uh, they were on the OTC. Um, they went from 47 cents to 319. Then they uplisted to NASDAQ. 
um, and they did that successful unit warrant combo offering I mentioned earlier. Interesting. First of all, I just saw that company at the Think Equity conference this morning, and it's very cool. It really is. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll just go back to Republic's uh, a Fig platform, where they help finance uh, video game video games for a lot of developers. Uh, it's been around for five years at this point, and, and it's done very well. Yeah, you guys kind of were pioneers of that. That was actually a really unique and a little bit complex securities offering. But I thought it was really cool because you're funding game video game developers, and you're getting if it's successful you benefit directly. from that and i i really thought yeah directly and i think that that's awesome all right we're going to jump over to, the, to take some of these questions uh we may run a little bit over here because there's quite a few um so let's go to um there was a question specifically for for deal maker if we if if they use deal maker do they have to use your reach marketing service or they can use their own people they that's kind of a world yeah we we see issuers using a variety of different marketing strategies so quickly I, I would call it like buy borrow build right so you can either buy with digital ad spend and there was questions about facebook or you can buy ad placements all kinds of different way that you're going to look at roas and you're going to buy traffic you can borrow by listing your offering um, in another angel group or something like that and, and raising from that network, that's going to be a lot cheaper. Um, and then maybe you've built your own community. So there was a couple of questions about, do you have to have your own community? You don't have to, um, but it definitely makes it cheaper because then you might use someone who can do email marketing campaigns. So variety of marketing firms with different strategies that you can put together. Okay, here's another question about, um, so it's it's a little bit confusing here, but they're asking about combining a Reg D offering with a, a Reg A plus or a Reg CF. Um, I've seen lots of CFs be partnered with with Reg Ds. Uh, Utan, you mentioned that there's a possibility to do a Reg A with with a Reg D. Do you want to address that really quickly? More from the perspective of yes, it's possible with the right disclaimers, disclosures, legal counsel, etc. Um, uh, we're seeing more folks that are launching a, a Reg CF and a Reg D at the same time oftentimes at the, at, with the same terms, um, before they decide to launch a Reg A, which is longer and more expensive to achieve because it positions them to be able to raise capital from anyone over 18, not accredited, not yet accredited investors in the Reg CF, while at the same time, expanding their efforts to accredited investors and institutions through their Reg D in an unlimited way of capital that they could reach. So you can run parallel offerings, the same terms, different terms, it's a matter of disclosure, um, but it is something that's often done. Okay, this next one I'm going to give to you, Doug. Um, what type of exit strategy or liquidity event is realistic? And it, and it mentions both Reg CF or an A-plus uh, company. Uh, the first thing I just want to say in response to the question you just asked, Eton, is be careful if you're talking about Reg D and it's a 506B mm -hmm. offering in particular, that would yeah. be problematic. If it's 506C and it's general solicitation, that's totally fine. Yeah. Um, uh, listen, and... and the exits are a limited number of exits, but if the Reg A plus deal is trading in one environment or another, then you can sell your securities at some point in time, regardless of the price, whether or not it's an appreciated price or a loss. Um, the company can have, have outright failure. Let's not kid ourselves. Let's not shy from it. That's part of the venture profile of these companies. Some will just fail. Others, if we pick them right and they actually build a business, they get sold or merge into another public company. And those are all the outcomes. Or if it's a debt deal, you can be repaid your money. Uh, so those are really realistically your options. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can still yep. see me, but I think you can hear me. Um, so if I'm a UK company, do I need to set up a US entity and use only USA service providers whom are regulated um, I think Utan and Rebecca, you both mentioned international firms. Uh, it depends on the exemption, but but for for a Reg A, it's not just a matter of an international company setting up shop here in the U.S. to finance their their base back where where they were. You, you need to be a legitimate operation here. There's there's uh, it, it is there's some you know opinions from different thought leaders in the space that you know some of which have we've published on our our website. Um, 
about kind of the nuance as far as how to achieve that. But ultimately, you know, board of directors, people that are making decisions, the beneficiary of the funds that are raised, the intention is to raise capital for US-based entities. So as, as the more it looks and feels and actually is that a reality, even if you have an international presence. Um, so, there, so, so there is certainly a path, but it needs to be navigated, you know, really, really properly with the right experienced counsel. Okay, Rebecca, did you want to add anything to that? No, Doug, maybe. Okay. I just, I, I don't, the only um, thing I would so add, it's a really a question. Is I thought it was North America. Is it just U.S.? I thought it was North America. North America, in if for reggae, right. the CF exactly. is just, uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I just uh, want to yeah, have I'll, a Canadian I'll, on the. On the, 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 Canadi the, the Canadians could, could 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 launch an offering, but they can't necessarily market it so easily to 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 Canada, which is <laughs> interesting. Exactly. Okay. Um, we have a deal maker question. Are are you relying on Facebook ad funnel leads? I, I agree with the comment there. So that's just one small piece of this strategy. You know, our team deal maker reach team can look at the company, the messaging, give you an estimate on the ROAS, how they would take it to market. Um, because I, I agree with what you said, Facebook can be challenging, but for the right issuers, it can still provide excellent returns. Okay. Uh, here's a question about uh, digital assets. I think we kind of answered this before, but I'm going to toss this over to you, Doug. Um, if your digital asset is set up to distribute earnings, how can it not be registered? S certainly, uh, under as a security under the Howey test. I think th the answer is it is a security, yeah, right, Doug? That, well, under the interpretation of the current SEC administration, you will presumptively be <laughs> deemed a security. I think there's still still more debate that's going to go on, but I still think that that's a good starting point and do believe that most digital assets have aspects that are securities. And if they're not securities in the first instance, when they trade secondarily and they're promoted, then they uh, there is case law to support the proposition that something that's not a security uh, on the primary can become a security depending on how you promote it later on. Okay. Um, how are VCs or funds getting around the 40 Act? This is a, a, a These are not 40 question. Act. Uh, if a 40 Act would be for pooled securities where you're managing assets for third parties, but more often than not, these people are investing in the direct securities themselves. They're not pooled. If it was a real estate pool, uh, like a REIT, which uh, Eton mentioned earlier, even though that's a specific tax vehicle, uh, it may require a 40 act analysis but most of the things that we've been talking about i do not believe are 40 act uh, issues okay here's this is a good question um are there examples of companies who have used reggae plus for multiple raises in different years um and in this environment do the costs typically go down or stay the same for an issuer raising the second or third time around um Itan, rebecca um why don't we start with uh uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, keep in mind that this is still a very young industry and it only started to really pick up, in fact, cross a billion a year collectively in 2019. So we're just now seeing these some of these repeat successful issuers, um, and some of whom, and, and there's a whole new approach that goes into how to structure your offering and stage an offering according to, you know, you, you may get qualified up to 75 million, but you may start with a $10 million offering Maybe you might achieve some milestones after that point and have some momentum and you have an option of coming back at a, at a higher valuation if you'd like. Um, so, you know, it's it's uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of these um, the, these these types of you know issuers that have had success in the past that are, you know, re upping, launching another offering. And as far as cost, I would say that um, the potential for the cost to go down exists if because you have already an existing community now that may be interested in um, increasing their participation in your next round or your next project. Uh, so, so marketing tends to be a little bit more expensive on the front end. Um, but, you know, once you have a sufficient base of people who know who you are, have interacted or at various stages of your funnel, uh, it has the potential to, to go down accordingly with, with proper funnel management. Yeah, I've seen it, multiple issuers use Reg A Plus again and again and again. Uh, it makes yeah. a lot of sense. Um, Miso ahead, Robotics, just going to give an example that that's our favorite case study. They've used the reggae multiple times, robotic burger flipping arm. Um, they've been really, you know, as they sign contracts with White Castle, Chipotle, Wingzone, 
Uh, the price in the offering company valuation goes up. In one point, I think the company valuation changed four times throughout the course of a longer reggae offering that they were doing. So a lot of really exciting things um, in the way that they use reggae for, for building that company. Uh, here's another question I think is interesting. Atlas Motors, because Atlas Motors raised money in a Reggae Plus, and then they listed their shares on NASDAQ. And I think either it's on or Rebecca, you guys work with that offering. No, we didn't what work with you, them, no. With that? Uh, does, any, does anybody want to comment on that? I think, I I think, it it's, was, I think it's a fabulous exam, example of a, of, of a, of a, comp, of a cool company that, that started with a CF and then went to A and then went to NASDAQ. You know, I think the one, Rebecca, that we worked on was, uh, was Trustamp, right? Uh, mm -hmm. similar similar trajectory these are these are oversubscribed you know cfs and 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 um it just shows you that it could happen it should and it sh hopefully shows you that that the the retail investors who believed in the company at the cf level you know are able to see you know have the chance of seeing spectacular returns which is not going to happen always um but when you see these examples it, it just is it's reassuring because you know that it, it, it it's possible you could point to a couple examples that you could model your your raise after, um, but but from a re from an investor perspective, don't don't go into this with the assumption that your your CF investment is going to go to Nasdaq. Go in go into it with the assumption you're going to lose your money, and but you have the opportunity to participate in what might become the next big thing, and and you have the opportunity to invest in yield generating instruments, etc. But you know you, you, you this but yes, there are certainly examples that are, that are emerging of you know that are you know worth uh, exploring too. But let's not let's, let's uh, not Doug, forget Helio you, Motors. Uh, Helio Motors, right, right, yeah. Right. We we don't have to talk about that. No reason not. <laughs> uh, Doug, how, how do you get your how, how do you how do you get your val your valuation validated for Reggae Plus as an issuer? Uh, I, I, my, I really probably my guess is uh, Eton and Rebecca would probably tell folks that's not their responsibility and they should seek outside advice otherwise you're giving investment advice uh, but the way to do it is to look at public market comps speak to investment bankers high and higher investment bankers ask enough sophisticated investors for their point of view uh, and you'll triangulate to an answer that's hopefully uh, a good one but picking the market leader and coming off some discount to the market leader and saying isn't it reasonable because I'm going to get one percent of the market probably isn't the best orientation for most folks. It's also hard to put a value on a startup uh, and they vary so greatly and they're and some of them have very broad patent based claim. It's 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 a very it's not not the easiest thing to uh, to do. So we, we, we advise people to look at what's been done. That's somewhat similar uh, to be realistic and grounded um, and, and and also be mindful of what the next round might be or an institutional mm -hmm. round after it might, might look like. Right, but the one thing I want to add to that is the higher the valuation, which is backed up by projections, which may or may not be based in reason, the more liability the company has yeah. for putting out yeah. valuations that don't turn out to be true. Right. And we are seeing more and more companies, we have independent valuation companies that'll do that, that work to research the comps, do three different types of analysis that give you as management that backup five, 10 grand for them to do that work. Wow. Yeah. And we're seeing more transparency in the mm -hmm. industry as far as listings with valuations like on King's Crowd, which I think is very healthy as well, because you get to start seeing how you know, what you're looking at is com compares to other similar things. And you could do your own kind of analysis that wasn't really available prior to that. Yeah, VC math. Um, here's uh, a, an issuer saying that uh, they're in Miami market and they're using regular plus to raise for tokenized real estate projects. Um, let's see, they just want to link up. Does anybody, are you guys seeing tokenized real it, estate? It, the definition offers? of that changes every month. And um, and and it's based off of experienced council's interaction with the SEC representing certain issuers with those those ambitions. Um, and so it's, it's pretty fascinating and, and frustrating at the same time. Um, you know, we're, there's all kinds of structures, but you, you know, you have, you could achieve a lot of what you're looking to achieve. Sometimes it's how you articulate and how you stage what you're looking to do. Uh, a, a, an STO offering is one thing. Uh, offering securities that comes with a token is, is perhaps a different thing. Um, and, and, you know, so it's really a, a discussion with folks like, 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 like Doug's team, 
and others that, that, have, that are going through that SEC process and seeing what the responses are like uh, and trying to avoid unnecessary wasting time um, by, by, you know, structuring it accordingly in the beginning. Um, but but the, it, it, we don't see as much on the, um, the digital side over the last few months. I think, um, I think the industry looks at crypto and Bitcoin and Web3 and digital. I'm not saying they should, but I think there's a, there's a misconception that everything is somewhat bunched together in that way. Uh, so I, I don't, I mean, it, perhaps it's a bit out of favor currently, um, especially because you could create a relatively seamless process of uh, uh, fractionalizing issuing and then facilitating secondary trading of private securities, all digital right now. Anyway, you don't necessarily have to tokenize something in order to achieve that. Can I say it in a less politically correct way? Like Eton <laughs> and, and I were on a panel with a very seasoned securities lawyer that we both know and respect. And the considered view was uh, hide the ball. Don't talk about blockchain or the digital security. Just talk about that you're doing a fractionalized real estate ownership. And then it's just technology that's behind the scenes. The second you add that word, you're probably going to have a lot of comments. Okay, we have a couple of Canadian questions here. I'm happy to see that. This one's for you. If you're a Canadian company, but you have a US sub and operations there, um, do, you, do you fund through a Canadian company or do you have to fund through the US uh, subsidiary? Rebecca? I think you can just fund through the parent co. Yeah. Okay. Um, I saw another question. There's, it was more of a Canadian question because they were asking about uh, cannabis firms raising funding under Reg A plus, how can they do that when it's not federally legal? Um, it is legal in Canada. Um, do you have any perspective on that? Uh, Rebecca? I think Doug, you'd probably frame it as risk factors, right? Yeah, you can, you can, you, you're not, you're, you can offer securities in the United States, the operations that were Canadian. And so that's not a, a problem. I mean, you could run into some banking uh, money transmittal issues but uh a lot of canadian companies have raised money in the us like we we have us based cannabis companies as well that the money transmission is is where you're going to run into issues because you're going to need a bank account and then we're going to need to get you payment rails but it can be done we have a few more uh, digital asset questions here somebody's asking if you can use reggae plus for a coin offering i think we've already discuss that as it stands now you can issue a digital security or you can attempt to but the sec is not very welcoming to these under reg a plus right now is yes, that correct you could do it you could do it on uh in reg d uh but if you want to register in reg a plus you're going to have difficulties um i'm gonna uh we're running out of time here last question uh do you work with nfts on blockchain to raise capital so with you at well, I, I, we work with issuers, reggae issuers, uh, who issue and fractionalize and, and sell NFTs as assets, as securities. Um, there, as far as blockchain, you know, ultimately with with reggae securities, it's the transfer agent that has the final say as far as who owns what, <laughs> right? So that and so you need to work with a, a transfer agent if you want to incorporate blockchain that mirrors that cap table you are able to but it doesn't necessarily unlock the full benefits of what blockchain rep represents at, at a, you know with you know in, in a future world with an increase or enhanced regulation um it could become that but but for now it's a it's a including blockchain is a choice but nfts uh yes we have clients that are that are that are offering uh shares of nfts on, on their platforms all right, I think, I think that's it. Um, let's go around the room real quickly with uh, parting thoughts. We're gonna start with you, Doug. Uh, uh, I, I think crowdfunding of all these various exemptions which uh, are interesting, but from a company's perspective, just a means to an end to record towards capital formation, uh, have demonstrated their viability, the legitimacy of the industry the seriousness of purpose of the participants involved, whether it's Eton or Rebecca, or many, many dozens of other people who've done an outstanding job for a decade. And I think I'd like to predict 10 years from now, the conversation is gonna be VCs worried that the crowdfunding industry has taken away good opportunities from them. 
Awesome. Rebecca. I'll echo that because I think the last two quarters, you know, where we've seen public markets effectively close, VC financing drive up, and yet this space continue to hold strong, I think has really disproved a lot of naysayers who say, oh, it was just a bubble. When the markets go down, it's going to disappear. It hasn't disappeared. It's been the strongest and most active sector. So it's really proved out to be a sector driven by completely different economic factors. That's a great complement to the rest of the capital markets. Fantastic. Right through the pandemic, right through geopolitical events, this has not slowed down. I don't think anything could slow down uh, the U.S. entrepreneurial drive. And now, finally, any entrepreneur has a path to take control of their own capital raising activity, to go to their own base, to go to their own supporters, to go to their own communities and beyond with what they with what they're working on to see if they have interest in participating in their growth. Uh, that's not going to slow down. And, and regulations have 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 helped unlock that ability. Folks like Doug back in you know the early 2000s were in D.C. advocating for this and we're kind of beneficiaries for all of their work. As we see these exemptions mature, uh, we're going to see more mature issuers. We're going to see more mature um, uh, you know, marketing strategies and you know, investor acquisition strategies. Uh, and um, I, I really feel like we're, we're really just at the beginning uh, of this industry. 27 million companies in the U.S. Many don't understand the alphabet of these exemptions we're even talking about. They're, just fi they're finishing Kickstarter or Indiegogo, and then they have to worry about how, to, how am I going to raise money to actually do this. This is a, the next step in your journey. Uh, and you could, depending, there's a, it's a little bit nuanced and you need to know your strategy. You need to know how to win before you start, right? You need to understand, you know, what, what, what the road ahead is going to look like. Um, but that's what we're super focused on. How do you win? What are the right strategies? Co-listing technology. How do you keep things cost effective uh, and efficient? Um, and, um, you know, it's really, uh, you know, we're super excited to, to be playing the role we do today and to be uh, sharing that with uh, with with you, Doug, and and Rebecca, with you guys, of course, as well. I agree. I think on that note, we will um, end the session. I know we can go a lot longer. I want to thank our three panelists, uh, Itan, Rebecca, and Doug, for uh, sharing your wisdom and uh, your your conviction and expertise in this market. I think it has a great potential and a fantastic future. And I want to thank everybody who's who has joined us today. I know that a copy of this video will be emailed out to everybody who made it here and everybody who was unable to make it here. And hopefully you will join us for our next session next month, which is on uh, digital securities, which we touched on a little bit today. Um, so thank you all for, for being here and uh, reach out and let's be in touch. Thank you, Take care. Bye-bye.